Hanukkah, everyone. Ira, happy Hanukkah. <laughs> See, there's one. Dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. Merry Christmas to the others. Merry Christmas. Well, that's better. Well, I am really, really excited about this message because um, a- about a week and a half ago, I realized that I was going to be speaking today and I had nothing. <laughs> and I was kind of panicking because I didn't. I didn't have a clue what I was going to speak about, but those of you who have known me for any length of time, you know that I have certain little soapboxes that I continue to go back to based on my own experience and my own life, and one of those is the issue of faith. This is something that is a really profound thing in my own life, and so I entitled this sermon, uh, Life Circumstances, Freak Out or Faith, (laughs) or How do we handle it when our plans change? Or life lessons we can learn from Mary. So I couldn't decide which one, so I just chose them all. So (laughs) I can't decide. So um, I guess last week, Benjamin Jensen did a stellar job uh, speaking. Let's give him a hand. I love the fact that we have so many people in this church that revere the word of God and love the word of God and are led by the word of God. I appreciate that. So I especially love the part I heard about. I haven't seen it online yet. You know our sermons are all online. Did you know that? You can either go on YouTube or you can go to our website, the Advent... um, what the heck is our website address? Adventurehome.org. Thank you. <laughs> but I heard about the apocalypse when the... So funny. Oh, my God. That is so funny. You know, when the, sh- when the pigs go over the edge of the, the apocalypse. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Get it? Apocalypse. Okay. Anyway. So I am really excited today about the message because it's about a young lady who can teach us a lot of things about faith. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. This is a reading of the word of God that is living and active. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. This is before ultrasound, okay? For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then... The angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. And Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things. To be honest with you, when I read this, I I have about 12 different messages I could teach out of this, but I'm really gonna focus on on the suddenlies of life and surprise when things surprise you and and how do you respond? How do we react when our circumstances change dramatically, instantaneously? How do we respond and what can we learn from Mary? So point number one, the number one thing is that the Lord suddenly interrupts our lives. Isn't that right? I know some of you weren't even alive yet, but, but the, the 9-11 attacks, we were all just living our lives, going about our day, and all of a sudden, everything changed, right? Everything. The people in San Bernardino, they went to a Christmas party, and suddenly, everything changed. Our circumstances can change radically in an instant, right? And how do we respond? Verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Okay, so let's unpack this a little. This is a, this is a lot of information right here. And I think that <clears throat> we become so accustomed year after year, we read the story and we kind of just kind of gloss over things and we don't really experience the full impact of what is really being said here. The sixth, I know it's disturbing, so... In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. So what do we know about Nazareth? I was trying to figure out what equivalent community would be in the area where we live, kind of where we live. The town that most closely resembles Nazareth, I think, would be uh, West Wendover, Nevada. except that West Wendover is about 10 times bigger than Nazareth. Nazareth was a little icky town that people just wanted to get through. The people there were evil. They were greedy. They were wicked. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, it even says, could any good thing come from Nazareth? It was not a cute little town. Nazareth was gross. Kind of like West Wendover. I have a horrible experience I could share with you that happened to me in West Wendover, but that's for another message, I think. (laughs) So here we have Mary. It is estimated that Mary was probably somewhere around 13 or 14 years old. She's living in this tiny little gross town called Nazareth with lots of evil people around her. She's going about her day just probably doing her chores, cooking up some lamb stew or something. She's just in the kitchen, cooking. Bam! An angel! Okay, let that just hit you for a second. Just imagine. Imagine yourself at home, just cooking your microwave popcorn, standing there waiting for it. (laughs) Boom! An angel appeared. An angel, okay? Hello, angel. And I'm not thinking it's like the little cute little fat cherub. It's like, oh, hey. (laughs) It's an angel, a magnificent angel. There's only two angels that are even named in the Bible, Gabriel and the archangel. It sounds ominous, doesn't it? So she's in there 
cooking away, and an angel appears. You know, when we first moved out here, um, we had three families that moved out with us, and one of the guys on our church planning team used to love to do this to me. I would be in the kitchen. My kids were little. They were one, three, five, and seven, and I would be in the kitchen. I would just be cooking, not lamb stew. I've never cooked that, but I would just be making the dinner, and he would come to the front door, and he would knock on the door and ask my kids to let him in. He would come, and there's a like the stove is here and there's a door right here. And he would come in and scare the daylights out of me. So I'd just be in there cooking. He'd get my kids to open the door and let him in and he'd come. It was like a sport to him. It was terrifying. I, I still need some therapy, but, um, but I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, Eric Carter is kind of scary, but not like Angel Gabriel. Imagine you're just going about your day and an angel shows up and is like, hey, what's up? (laughs) It's not like, I mean, some of the versions they say, hail Mary. You know, even this greetings, it's like, who says that? Who does that? You know, it's like, hey, how's it going? I mean, it was like that. It was like a normal, hey, how are you? Kind of just normal greeting. (laughs) And he says, he says, you know, don't be afraid. (laughs) imagine? Really? Don't be afraid? (laughs) You know, God has the right to interrupt our lives in any way he feels. He doesn't have to ask us for permission. He certainly didn't ask Mary for permission. Here she is going about her day. She's betrothed, which means she was engaged, which in the Jewish culture means that you're essentially married, except without the perks of marriage, if you know what I'm saying. We're PG here. So you can't have relations. You're, you're betrothed to each other. You're committed to one another. But this is, this is the most beautiful picture of Christ in the church. But the groom goes to prepare a home for the bride while she waits for him to come and take her back. And the bride doesn't know I mean, that's a little scary for some of us ladies to think about that. You don't know when your wedding day is going to happen. You just have to be ready. And then the groom comes back and he takes you. And it says that the groom is preparing a place in the same way that Jesus, the head of the church, and we are his bride, the church is his bride, he's preparing a place for us as well. Isn't that such a cool picture? So that's why Mary was just kind of hanging out You know, girls in that day were not educated. Although, Mary clearly knew what it said in the Torah. She clearly knew what the word of God said because she was a devout Jewish girl. And so she understood what the scripture said, which is evidence later on when she she is praising God. She's, She's declaring his faithfulness and she's quoting scriptures from the Old Testament. Mary was the virgin that was talked about in Isaiah 7, and she had certainly heard this. She knew that one of the prophecies concerning the Messiah to come was that he would be born of a virgin. She knew this, but she probably never, ever suspected that it would be her. It had been 400 years since they had heard anything from the Lord. They had just been waiting and waiting and waiting. She was from the tribe of Judah. I mean, do you know that there are over 300, and I think it's 350 some, you you can Google it, but um, prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his coming. I mean, the chances of this happening are astronomical, but Jesus fulfilled all of them. And Mary knew a lot of these prophecies that spoke about his coming And the main one that applied to her life was that a virgin would conceive and give birth to the Messiah. So as you can imagine, this angel shows up and he says, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. You have found favor with God. And we don't need to fear. 
in those times when life circumstances hit us and we are confused and disturbed like Mary was? We don't need to fear. You know, there's all kinds of controversy uh, about how many times it says, do not fear, be not afraid, don't be anxious, all of these things. The fact is, if, if it's said once in the Bible, it's, it's significant. But it's probably over 300 times that it's spoken, do not fear, be not afraid, fear not, be anxious for nothing, over and over and over. And yet, what's the first thing that we typically do when something happens? What's the first thing that we typically do? Anybody? Freak out. out. Pretty much. Freak out. Get scared. Get stressed. Worry. And yet, the angel says, don't be afraid. Why not? Why doesn't she need to be afraid? Because she's found favor with God. And we, too, don't have to fear Because if we truly believe in God, and I'm assuming most of you probably believe in God, since you're here, or at least the possibility that there might be a God. But if we believe in God, we need to believe that he is who he says he is. We need to believe what he says about himself, not our own emotions. Our own emotions will lead us astray. The Bible says, my flesh and my heart will fail me. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And so if we, because of the cross, have found favor with God and found acceptance with God, and if he calls us holy and righteous and precious and honored in his sight, then we need to believe that, no matter what life circumstances bring to us. You know, sometimes it's hard for us to remember that the Lord is truly interested in every circumstance of our lives. Do you ever have those times where you feel like, I'm pretty sure God didn't think this one through. (laughs) Pretty sure he let this one slip off the old to-do list, the whole rescuing me thing. You know, it it was so cool today. Every single song in worship related to exactly what I felt like the Lord was saying, good job. making that song list. All things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You make all things work together for good. You came to my rescue. All of these things are true of God, and if we believe him, then we must believe that he is, in fact, trustworthy, that we can trust him. Even when the mountains, you know, the, the, God, is, God is our Refuge in our strength and ever-present help in time of need. Therefore, we do not fear. Even if the mountains shake and and they fall into the heart of the sea, we don't need to fear because God is with us. We don't need to be afraid. And it's so easy for us to look at circumstances and base our emotions on what's happening around us rather than going to the word of God and and reading what he says about himself, what he says about when we go through hard times, what it is that the Bible says about when we struggle. You know, we live in a time where our society is disturbed and confused. And when horrible things happen, like this shooting in San Bernardino, it causes a lot of confusion and it causes us to be very disturbed. But I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, I know God is going to fix this. God is going to be glorified. Right now, it looks desperate and scary, but I tell you, church, you do not need to be afraid. You do not need to fear. You have found favor with God. He loves you, and he has a plan for your life, no matter what it looks like right now, no matter what your circumstances bring, he has a plan. It is natural for us to question. Verse 31, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great 
and he will be called the son of God, of the most high. It doesn't say he will be a son, he will be the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. Think about this, okay? Think about this. Here she is, stern or stew. Gabriel shows up. She kind of gets a little freaked out, confused and disturbed. And he tells her this amazing prophecy, this amazing promise, which she's been learning about from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, that a virgin will conceive. And she's like, oh, it's me. What? It's amazing. It's incredible. But she's still thinking, how is this going to happen? Because I'm a virgin. Like, I don't know if you're aware of this, Gabriel, but uh, <laughs> I've never known a man. I've never been with anyone that way. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> right? You know, most people, when they hear from God and hear a promise from God, most people tend to question it. Just, I mean, it, even what David just got up here and said, we question it because we know ourselves. We know our inadequacies, we know our shortcomings, we know our weaknesses, but I'm telling you, it says in the word of God, all of his promises are yes and amen. For the, those of us who know him, all of his promises are yes and amen. Who are some of the people that questioned in the Old Testament? This is our interactive time right now. Moses, Moses what was his deal? He stuttered. I can't speak. Right? That was his deal. That was his reason why God couldn't use him. Who else? Anybody else? Noah. Yeah, Noah had a problem too. He's like, wait a minute. I've never heard of this thing called rain. <laughs> what? <laughs> Adam and Eve. Now, how did they question? They were the only people. Oh, yeah. They questioned whether or not they could trust God. How about Gideon? That guy needed some serious convincing. <laughs> I mean, over and over and over. God must have been like, oh, Gideon, what am I going to do with you? I don't know. <laughs> Gideon was really, he, he needed to be convinced over and over. That's a great story. Who else? Jonah. Jonah. Stiff-necked Jonah did not want to go to those people in Nineveh. They were kind of like the people in West Wendover. <laughs> he did not want to go there. <laughs> I apologize if you're from West Wendover. Please forgive me. <laughs> Jesus loves you. <laughs> For real. How about Sarah? Sarah cracked up. She's like, <laughs> I'm 90. I'm going to have a baby. Whatever. <laughs> she didn't believe it. I mean, that, you have to admit, I mean, from a biological standpoint, she's postmenopausal, and she's going to have a baby? I could see where she would laugh. It's kind of funny, right? Alicia, uh, Alicia was bald and ticked off about it. Yeah, yeah, that's true, huh? Okay, how about Jeremiah? Thought he was too young. He needed to be convinced. There's so many people that they look at themselves and they're like, hey, okay, Thank you so much for the, you know, for the props, but I am really not, I'm not adequate for the job. So you're going to need to find someone who is. The problem is there isn't anyone else. When God calls you to a certain thing, you are the only one who can be that person. Like I always say, you have to be yourself because everyone else is taken. You have to just be yourself. And when God speaks a promise to you, like he does over and over in the Bible, he is speaking it to you. Not every promise at every time. They don't all apply at every time. 
But when you read the word of God and he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will not reject you. I will accept you. I will, I will forgive you. I will do all of these things. When he says those things, he is talking to you. It's not, just, it's not just for everyone else. These are not just platitudes that don't apply to you because of your inadequacy or your sin or your failure or your shortcoming or your history and mine. These things apply because God says that they apply. And, and we cannot question the God of the universe the creator of heaven and earth, we cannot question him when he specifically says something to us. You know, there's that um, rhetorical song. It's a beautiful song. Mary, did you know? You know the answer, right? No, she did not know. (laughs) She did not know the depth of the pain that she was going to experience even though she was warned. But we can't know going into circumstances, into the hardships of life, into trials, into the suddenlies that invade our lives. We, we have no idea how to get through it, but we don't have to know. We want to know, human beings in general, we want to know the outcome because we want to control. We want to be in charge, don't we? But God's calling is to let go, to surrender, to trust, to have faith. So let me ask you, when life's circumstances interrupt you, when you're surprised by something, how do you respond? How do you react? Okay, freak out, there's that. What else? What other things? Do you become angry? Do you start to doubt God? Do you start to blame God? Do you try to, oh, okay, let me see. Okay, that's what God said. Now I'm going to figure out how to make this happen. Yeah? Do you make excuses? Do you focus on your inadequacies? Do you say, uh, not going to happen because I've known me most of my life. <laughs> There's a couple years in the beginning where I didn't really... We cannot underestimate the promises of God and the call that God has on each and every one of you. You cannot underestimate that. You know that it says in James, I love this, James 5.17, it says, Elijah was as human as we are. Elijah, the prophet, the guy who made, uh, I love my fire pit, okay? I love my fire pit, but when those logs are a little bit wet, it's really hard to start a fire. He, Elijah, because of the prophets that were worshiping false gods, he poured water on his fire, and he's like, okay, let's see who can make fire. I mean, I think he kind of, I think he was mocking a little bit. (laughs) But fire came up out of wet logs, or whatever they were. How did that happen? Because of God. But he was as human as you are. Elijah was just as human as you are. He was just as flawed. You know, after, after God demonstrated his power to Elijah, this is such a great story, you guys should read this, and that's not what this message is about, but it's such an awesome story. But you know, immediately after that, he ran and hid in the cave because he was scared. It's like, what? Are you kidding me? I mean, of course, we can look back and go, why would you do that? Because, of course, we think we wouldn't do that, but would we do that? He was scared. He was being pursued. But he was as human as we are, which is evidenced in the Bible, which is why I love the stories in the Bible, because they show people's humanity. The stories in in the Old Testament are so that we can learn from their mistakes, which is a much nicer way to learn it. I was talking with Corinne. It's like, I would rather learn life's lessons by reading the book rather than having to take the test because the test is not fun. (laughs) So let me just ask you, 
What do you do? How do you respond when you don't get your way? When God pulls a fast one or whatever you want to say. When God surprises you with some circumstance. How do you respond? I prefer to pout. You pout? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's pretty common. I'm sorry? Yeah, get paralyzed. Like, I can't do anything. What else? Anybody? Talk back to God? Yeah. Grumble? You know, the Bible says, who are you to talk back to God? Who are you to talk back to God? Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. We we doubt God. We doubt his goodness. We doubt his character. A.W. Tozer, who's one of my favorite authors... I can only take him in really small doses, though, because it's always so profound. I have to sit and meditate on some of, his, some of his quotes. He says, The true follower of Christ will not ask, If I embrace this truth, what will it cost me? Rather, he will say, This is truth. God, help me walk in it. God, let come what may. We tell the king of all creation what's wrong with how things are going in our lives, don't we? We tell him what we're, what we're upset about. We tell him what we think he should change, because he does have the power to change it. But we get annoyed. We get depressed. We get frustrated. We get stressed. We check out. We self-medicate. We let the circumstances weigh us down. We try to bargain with God. But we are not in a position to bargain with the God of the universe. We are not in a position, we don't get a vote. And if you believe in God, this is something that you have to accept. You have to embrace this. He is all powerful and we are not. Isaiah 45, 6. My, oh, there we go. I am the Lord, there is no other. I create the light and make the darkness. I send good times and bad times. I, the Lord, am the one who does these things. The NIV says, I create disaster. Why would God do that? Why would he do that? Why would he invade the life of a 13 or 14-year-old girl and mess her whole life up with this? Because that's what it would look like in the beginning. We don't see the blessing on the other side. All we see is today. We see the circumstances of today. And for Mary, you know, in the Old Covenant, in the Levitical law, that if a woman is pregnant out of wedlock, she can be taken to the town center and stoned to death. They killed people for this. They threw rocks at them till they died. Yeah, it's a big deal. Plus, how is she going to explain this to Joseph? Okay, so... I was baking dinner, and this angel showed up and said that I'm going to have a baby. (laughs) But I promise, I haven't been with anyone else. I promise. You know, you read that whole story, it's like they are as human as we are. Just like Elijah. It says he is as human as we are. But when he prayed for three and a half years, it didn't rain. He's like us. He's like me. He's like you. He's like you. Do you believe that your prayers are that fervent that, that if you earnestly prayed, it wouldn't rain for three and a half years? And then if you pray again, then it's going to start raining like Elijah? I don't have that kind of faith in my own prayers. But he's a guy just like us. Mary was just like us, except she was selected for this one specific task. She was not perfect Mary had sin. Mary was tempted. Just because she was a virgin didn't mean that she didn't have a sin nature. 
She had a sin nature just like we do. Is that, does that change some of your ideology about Mary? Our trust must be in the Lord regardless of what we believe about ourselves. Verse 35 says, <clears throat> the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, incidentally, I know you haven't checked Facebook this morning, but <clears throat> Elizabeth is pregnant. Okay, now here's the story. Here's the backstory on that. Zechariah and Elizabeth are these righteous, godly people, and they have been praying and praying and praying for years for her to conceive a child. And in those days, it was a disgrace for women who could not conceive. And justifiably, Zechariah could have left her for another woman who would provide a baby for him, offspring for him. But yet they continued to trust the Lord. They continued to pray. They continued to seek God. Even when she was labeled barren, she conceived a child. And so it says, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. See, Mary is humble and submissive and obedient. She says, I am doulas, which means a handmaiden of the Lord. She, like, basically, I am a slave of the Lord. May it be to me as you have said. Is that how we respond when life doesn't treat us the way we believe we deserve? Mary was prepared to say yes, no matter what, no matter what happened in the future. And in the same way, her son Jesus in the garden said, Lord, may this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Is that your prayer? Is that your prayer, Lord, no matter what? I trust you. I believe you. I believe you're good. I believe you have plans for my future. I believe that you're in control. I believe you have not let this slip out of your hands. Verse 37, some translations say, nothing is impossible with God. Some translations say, for no word of God will be void of power. This is a miraculous thing, but it wasn't without its consequence. You know, Mary probably had a reputation in Nazareth as being a good girl. Nazareth was being an evil city. She didn't ask, though. She didn't say, well, what about my reputation? What about my witness? She didn't say that. She didn't say, well, <clears throat> how am I going to explain this to my parents? Like, I am going to be so grounded. <laughs> she didn't have to say any of that stuff. She didn't ask any of that. She said, may it be to me according to what you've said. So the next thing she does is she, she waits on the Lord and seeks confirmation with godly people. Verse 39, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound, check this out now, at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth, Elizabeth's child, it's not a blob of tissue, it's a child, Amen. leapt within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the prophecy about, does anybody know who her baby was? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Yeah. I, I know he's always portrayed as like this really serious, somber guy, but I have a feeling he was probably kind of funny. Some of the stuff about him, I'm like, he must have had a good sense of humor. But that's another message. Anyway, 
The child leapt within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord, and the word that's used there is kurios, which means God Almighty, the Almighty God. She called Jesus Lord, kurios. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Okay, so go back to Nazareth. Here's Mary, had this conversation with this Gabriel angel. She seeks confirmation. They didn't live next door. They lived uh, Zechariah, and Elizabeth lived, they say, between probably 70 to 100 miles away. So when the angel comes to her, <clears throat> and he's like, uh, by the way, <laughs> you're going to get pregnant, and it's going to be the Holy Spirit that's going to make you pregnant, and your relative, Elizabeth, she's also in her sixth month of pregnancy. This is before Facebook, okay, so... Mary hadn't checked the status and liked Elizabeth's status. I'm pregnant, yay! It wasn't like that. Mary had to go to Elizabeth to get that confirmation. Because think about it. If Elizabeth was in her sixth month of pregnancy, that means that it wasn't just a dream she had or a bur bad burrito, that this was actually what was going to happen. It was a confirmation that she was seeking. She sought her confirmation with godly people. She didn't go to the people in Nazareth and go, hey, check this out. So this angel showed up at my house and told me that I'm going to have a baby. She didn't go to the godless. She went to godly, righteous people. Now, this is a shameless plug, but if you are not involved in a community group, I strongly, strongly suggest that you do so. Get involved. Be involved with people who know the word, who know the Lord, who can hear his voice, and who can confirm to you the things that you're going through. They can pray with you. They can minister life to you. I mean, here at The Adventure, the reason that we want you to be involved in a community group is for your benefit and for your blessing. Because there is a confirmation that comes through being with people that know the Lord. And that's kind of what Mary was doing. She was going to Elizabeth and Zechariah to find out if what the angel had said could possibly, possibly be true. Our counsel must be with those who know and trust the Lord. Do not seek the world and the world's methods for your confirmation. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. It says that... <clears throat> Mary is blessed because she believed. I'm going to say something kind of bold here. God does not bless negativity because it's contrary to faith. Because faith, like it says in Hebrews 11, faith is being sure of what we hope for and convinced of what we have not yet seen. And it says in Hebrews eleven six, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. We have to believe that he exists and that he is the one who will reward those who seek him earnestly. I firmly believe that faith leads to gratitude because if you really believe that God is who he says he is, it will cause you to give thanks and I believe that gratitude leads to joy. So if you're lacking joy in your life, and if you're letting life circumstances weigh you down, I just encourage you to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I believe that God will give you the joy and the peace and the trust and the hope that you are lacking. If we can see the outcome, it doesn't require faith. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and convinced of what we have not yet seen. You know, this week, uh, Friday night, I received a text from a, another blessed Mary. Um, she has been going to this church since 
we first started, Mary Culbertson, she's one of our young adults. She's actually down in American Fork leading worship this morning. And she was in a, a little fender bender on Friday night. And she's okay, because she's down there leading worship. But she texted me, and I asked her how she was. And she said, quote, I'm just nervous and worried, a.k.a. confused and disturbed, like Mary, the other Mary. She says, I'm just nervous and worried, but I know I'm here for a reason, that's for sure. I was so blessed to get a text from this young lady who, despite having life circumstance kind of surprise her, Despite having something kind of horrible happen that night, she, she wasn't planning to get in a car accident. But she recognized that she was there for a reason. And she put her hope immediately in the Lord. Immediately she put her trust back in the Lord. So rather than worrying and freaking out when life circumstances hit us, what we need to do is worship. Worship. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy. And he has done great things for me. The word of God was hidden in Mary's heart. She knew his word. And we too have to know, what does the Lord say about himself in the Bible? How does he describe himself to us? Mary knew his character. She knew the character of God. She knew that even if she didn't understand it, that she could trust him. And we too, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of trials, in the midst of life surprising us, in the midst of tragedy, we can still trust the Lord. We can still believe that he is who he says he is. We can still believe that all of his promises are yes and amen. Do you believe that the Lord has a plan for you? Do you? Do you believe that he has plans to prosper you? Do you believe he has plans to give you a hope and a future? Do you believe that he wants to harm you? He wants to discipline us, but that's so different. That's for our benefit. See, Mary responds with praise. She is humble. She's submitted. She's obedient. And she says yes to the Lord. And that's my challenge for you today. Can you say yes to the Lord? No matter what. No matter what. You know, the Bible says, make the most of your time for these days are evil. Can you confirm that with me? These days are evil. We need to make the most of our time. And the way that we do that is saying yes to the Lord. You know, I just, I think it is so difficult to be a Christian in America because we're so distracted. We've got all our first world problems, you know. It's so hard for us to really see our desperation for God sometimes. But rather than focusing on our circumstances, rather than focusing on our inadequacies, we need to focus on Him. We need to worship Him and celebrate His character and His goodness. Because I promise you, God is going to fix this. God is going to be glorified in all the earth. That's His promise. So if you're able, I'd like to ask if you would stand with me so we could read this one of my favorite passages in the Word of God. So let's read this together out loud. And can you read it and allow the Holy Spirit to increase your faith? Open yourselves up to being changed, to have your mind changed by the Lord. Read this together. O oh Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, may you be praised forever and ever. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O oh Lord, and this is your kingdom. 
We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have comes has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. Amen. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. You are good. You are righteous and holy. Bless you, Lord. And now I would like to pray, and I would like you to respond back the same thing that I pray. If you believe it, I don't want to make you a liar or a hypocrite. If you believe what I'm saying, if you believe what I pray, pray it back in response. Okay? I'm Lutheran. That's how we do things. (laughs) I mean, I was. I was raised Lutheran. Okay? Can you allow the Holy Spirit to change your mind? Can you open yourself up to being changed by him? lift up our holy hands like the Bible says. Oh Lord, we thank you. We bless your name. We thank you that you are holy. We thank you that you know all things. We thank you that you are sovereign. You are all powerful. You know all things. You do all things well, and in you we live and move and have our being. We surrender to you this morning. We say to you, Lord, just like Mary, we are your servants. We are your slaves. We want to know you more. We want to do what you've called us to do. We confess to you, Lord, we haven't believed you. We haven't trusted you. I haven't believed you. I haven't trusted you. I haven't believed that you have my best in mind. But today, Lord, I commit to you. I will trust you. I will give you thanks. I will give you praise. I will not focus on my circumstances. I will not focus on my inadequacies. But I will trust you, Lord. I will give you glory because I will believe what you've said. Because you are good. And you know all things. And I bless you in the name of Jesus. Now let's lift up his name. We bless your name, Lord. You are so good. You are so righteous. So bless you, Lord. Amen. Now I challenge you this week when you're surprised or when your life gets interrupted, what are you going to do? Praise the Lord. Give him thanks. I promise you it is the way to live. I promise you, it is the way to live. No matter what happens, may it be to me as you have said. His promise is to bless, so give him thanks and trust in him. Amen? Merry Christmas. See you guys next week. Love you guys. Hey, I'm Murph, and we really hope that you enjoyed this week's Adventure TV broadcast. We here at The Adventure have two main goals, to love God and to love people. And we hope that you felt that through this week's broadcast. If you would like to join us on Sunday mornings, we have services at 9 and 11, and also on adventurehome.org. Thank you again, and God bless. All creation worships you. All in